Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Kennedy. I work here at History Nebraska in education. Welcome to History Nebraska's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday at Old Father Family Auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum in Lincoln. Learn more about History Nebraska and our programs and services at history.nebraska.gov. If you are not a member of History Nebraska, I, I encourage you to join. Your support allows us to provide programs like the Brown Bag Lecture Series, free for all Nebraskans. For a full list of benefit, benefit membership, benefits of membership, visit our website. Special thanks to Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs across the state. We'd also like to thank LNKTV, a service of the City of Lincoln which produces these programs. If you would like to watch previous Brown Bag lectures, visit the History Nebraska YouTube page at www.youtube.com slash History Nebraska and see playlists. Our topic today is about the lives of Omaha's legendary black athletes who rose out of segregation as racial tensions grew. Our speaker today is Dirk Chatelain. Uh, regarding questions today, he would prefer you wait until the end of the talk uh, to ask your questions. Dirk Chadlin is a lifelong Nebraskan, a native of Rising City, population 392. He graduated from Columbus High School and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and now resides in Gretna. A five-time Nebraska Sports Writer of the Year, his 14-year journalism career includes 18 Associated Press Sports Editor Top 10 Awards. 24th in Glory is his first book project. Please join me in welcoming Dirk Chatelain. Thank you for having me. This is a, this is a great thrill. Uh, History Nebraska has been uh, a big supporter of the book project and is, is one of the primary reasons it happened. So uh, I want you to imagine, imagine a moment in time when the best baseball player in America is from Omaha. The best football player in America is from Omaha. One of the 10 leading scorers in the NBA is from Omaha. A uh, future Heisman Trophy winner playing at Tech High as a senior, obviously Omaha. The, the best rookie quarterback in professional football is from Omaha. One of the leading uh, rookies in the ABA is from Omaha, all at the same time. And this isn't just Omaha. This is a neighborhood basically one square mile in size, roughly two rising cities in size. And this isn't just one square, square mile of, of Omaha, North Omaha. This is uh, a collection of, of young black men at a time in America where uh, racial conflict and tumult is higher than it's been in 50 years. And we have all these things happening at the same time, in the same place, uh, in the year of 1968, which you don't have to be a professional historian to know the significance of 1968. So when people ask, what's this about, it, it, that's, that's kind of the gist. And Ken Burns has a, has a quote uh, I, I heard recently on a podcast. He said, I know of nothing more urgent than the history you don't know. And I subscribe to that belief. I also uh, am a procrastinator and uh, a self-doubter. And this story and most of the interviews for this story sat on my shelf for about 10 years. And I would walk by it and I would just mumble to myself and grumble. Uh, and I lost my hair and I got married and I had kids and I lost more hair and the marriage and the kids might have had something to do with that. And uh, this, this tub full of interviews and materials uh, moved houses with me and I just kinda, it just kind of gnawed at me because I kept coming back to this date, this, this one date on the calendar that was like seared into my memory and it's October 6, 1968. 
October 6, 1968, in a matter of about two hours on a Sunday afternoon, Bob Gibson won his seventh consecutive World Series game. That was a Major League Baseball record. Gail Sayers rushed for 100 yards, including a 60-yard touchdown run against the Baltimore Colts. Uh, he called it the finest run of his, of his football career, which you know, if you know Gail Sayers' career, uh, that's, that's some pretty imp impressive stuff to have the greatest run of his career. And Marlon Briscoe, another Omaha, uh, became the first black man to, to start a professional football game at quarterback, the most prestigious position in sports. All these th three things, same Sunday afternoon, October 6, 1968, while everything in America is exploding around them. And I just, I couldn't shake this thought. And on one hand, it was like, hey, I'm a, I'm a young white guy from rural Nebraska. What do I know about their experience? Uh, these are old black men from North Omaha. On the other hand, it was like, this story has to be told. It's the best untold story that I've ever heard, uh, local story. And I, I, I sort of went back uh, and, and read those interviews again and went over the materials again and went all the way back to, two, to, to 2006, October 2006, when I discovered that date on the calendar. Um, and that's kind of when I started doing the research for this project. And I wanted to know not just how do, these, how do the stars align, because obviously coincidence is part of this, but it's also what's the real story behind it? How does this happen? You know, there's a journalism instinct that kicks in uh, that realizes a piece of trivia is not the story. It's, it's sort of the flashing light for a story that's much deeper than that. And I started making phone calls. And I called, I got a hold of a guy named Rodney Weed. And Rodney Weed is very prominent in this story. He's sort of a Forrest Gump type character who's, who just has experiences with a lot of different people in it all the way back from Malcolm X to chauffeuring Martin Luther King uh, down to Nebraska Wesleyan for speaking, speaking engagements in the late 50s, to being uh, Bob Gibson's best friend, to uh, protesting George Wallace. We'll get to all of that. But Rodney Weed is sort of the, he's kind of the, the unofficial narrator of this story. And I, I called him and I, I told him you know, about October 6, 1968, and I said, what's, what's the story behind this? And Rodney opened my eyes to a world, like a magical world, that I, I didn't even know existed. Again, I'm from Rising City, Nebraska, okay? My understanding of North Omaha in the late 60s growing up was this is a place uh, where you don't go after dark. This is a place where the, uh, the windows are broken and the lots are abandoned. And 24th and Lake Street was a place where you only saw on the news with, with riots and fires, and that, those were the stories that, that adults around told me. And Rodney basically said, no, 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 you got it all wrong. When I was growing up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, 24th and Lake and North Omaha was the most vibrant, cohesive, bustling place in the entire city and in, in the entire state. And Rodney said, uh, to really understand that, to understand how there were 170 businesses from Cumming Street to Lake Street on 24th, to understand how you, uh, you could have a doctor and a lawyer and an accountant and a teacher and a janitor all living in the same neighborhood together. To understand that, you have to go all the way back to the 19-teens and the Great Migration. And um, so we go back to 1915, 16, 17, when millions of blacks in America flooded out of the South uh, up to northern cities in search of better jobs, in search of sanctuary and safety. Uh, they came to Kansas City and Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Chicago, and they came to Omaha. Does anybody know why they came, they came to Omaha? Cows, okay? We had cows, lots and lots of cows. And in, about a, in a span of about 25 years, uh, from the late 1800s to basically World War I, Omaha and South Omaha especially sort of just boomed into this huge uh, stockyards and meatpacking hub in America. And those meatpacking giants, those owners, they needed people to work the most gory and difficult jobs in the stockyards. And it wasn't the stuff outside with the pens, it was the stuff inside the packing houses. So Armour, Swift, Cuddy Hay Wilson, the big four, they go recruiting, okay? And they recruit 
They recruit Europe. Uh, they find Eastern European immigrants, Lithuanians, Czechoslovakians, Polacks. Uh, they also go down to the south and they start putting ads in uh, southern black newspapers, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and they say basically we need workers. We need people who will do the jobs that other people don't want to do. And blacks out of the south came north to Omaha, Nebraska, where 100 years later, if you talk to uh, African Americans on, on the east and west coast, they still don't know that blacks live in Omaha. But uh, 100 years ago, that, that changed very rapidly. And thousands of black families came north to work the packing houses. They worked the kill floors. They worked the hide cellars. They worked everywhere in between. And the jobs were so difficult uh, that one guy told me that you walked in, you, you went in at 7 o'clock in the morning as a 25-year-old, and you walked out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon as a 40-year-old. Okay? These were difficult jobs. People's lost, they lost fingers. They lost hands. Uh, but why did they do it? Because the money was good. The money was very, very good compared to the other industries that were available. And so these black workers would get out of there at 4 o'clock, and they would take the, uh, the, the Jitney car back to, to North Omaha, and they would roll past 24th and Cumming Street into this neighborhood that was, uh, again, like something, it was like a little square mile out of the south. And I wanted to read to you, uh, I don't normally do this, but uh, we'll see how it goes today. But I wanted to read you just a, a small excerpt from, from 24th Street in uh, the late 40s. When you reach the bricks of 24th Street, streetcar wires stretched from wooden poles like spider webs. Trolleys carried beef luggers and hotel maids passed storefront windows marked with daily sales. Fresh pastries wafted out of Jewish bakeries and onto the sidewalk, competing with the ever-present scent of Omaha's perfume, downright potent when the south wind blew, manure. Past the jitney stands and meat markets, church steeples and synagogues, doctors and lawyers' offices, in just one mile of 24th Street from coming to Ohio, you could count 170 businesses, their signs competing for attention like kids at mama's feet. Seven tailors, seven cigar shops, 12 beauty shops, 13 grocery stores, 16 restaurants, and so many taverns where crowds spilled into the streets for the occasional fist fight. Play nine ball at Jimmy Jewel's, eat chitlins at DeWitt's, listen to 78's at Allen's Record Shop. Poke your head into Federal Market where families charged groceries and paid up at week's end. Mr. Lewis kept stacks of IOUs. Squint under the, under the sparkling marquee of the Ritz Theater with its sticky floors and greasy popcorn. Put on your suit and squeeze into the Dreamland Ballroom where jazz and blues orchestras, sweating in their white tuxedos, bounced beats off the walls, sometimes toting their horns right out the door, down the staircase, into the street, and back up to the stage, blaring the whole way. Okay, this was North Omaha in the 40s and 50s. And um, it, was, it was a place where, where there was a real sense of community. And there was a real sense of community in large part because they couldn't leave. This was Nebraska's uh, biggest and basically only segregated neighborhood at that time. And it was a place where blacks didn't have the same access to movie theater tickets, to bank loans, to doctors. Uh, when Bob Boozer, when young Bob Boozer went to the downtown YMCA with his friends uh, in the late 40s to go swimming, they drained the pool when the boys left. Okay? This is a place where racism is stark. And you do not forget who you are and where you, where you belong. But out of that uh, rises this competitive, cohesive, chip-on-the-shoulder generation of young black kids that will go on to be the greatest generation of athletes that Nebraska has ever known. And to have a movement like that, you need a spark. And the spark is a, uh, a World War II veteran named Josh Gibson. Josh Gibson comes home in 1945 from India, and uh, Josh uh, served four years overseas. He's a Tech High graduate of 1939, born in Louisiana, came up north with his family. Uh, his, his father passed away in 1935. His mother is still there, but Josh sort of becomes the father figure. While he is gone in India for World War II, he has a brother who's 15 years younger than him 
who sort of goes off the rails for about four years. And this 11-year-old boy is getting in trouble in all sorts of ways. He's, he's reaching in windows and stealing pastries from Jewish, Jewish bakeries. Uh, he is pulling the brakes on a streetcar. He is uh, getting notes from the teachers and ripping them up before he takes them home to mom. I mean, this kid is all over the place. And you probably have figured out who this might be. This is the greatest athlete in Nebraska history, okay? This is Bob Gibson. And when Josh comes home, he sees Bob uh, undisciplined and reckless and needing some source of inspiration. And Josh has an idea. Uh, Josh is driven and tenacious, just like his little brother. And Josh uh, recognizes that, that Bob needs something. Josh has his own dreams, though. He wants to be... He wants to be a teacher. He wants to be a coach. And when he comes home from war, he gets his degree from Omaha University. He'll get a master's degree from Creighton. But he wants to, uh, he wants to work in Omaha Public Schools. The problem is OPS uh, doesn't hire black high school coaches and teachers until 1963. So Josh needs something. Bob needs something. And in that moment, in the spring of 1947, they basically find something in each other. And Josh uh, understand what, understands what's going on in the country at that time, and he takes a shovel and carries it over to the, to the schoolyard at Kellum School, and he builds up a pitcher's mound. And all year, almost every night, he and his little brother, 27-year-old, 12-year-old, uh, they throw the ball back and forth. And Bob Boozer still remembers walking by this schoolyard and hearing this sound, pop, 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 pop. Bob Gibson, Josh Gibson playing catch back and forth. Well, there's a reason they chose baseball. Because, again, remember the timing on this. This is the spring of 1947. What is going on in the spring of 1947 in America? There is a very prominent black athlete emerging uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers, Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson is the inspiration for this family. And I wish I could go back and ask Josh uh, what was the moment, because there had to be some sort of vision in his mind, what was the moment where you saw what Jackie was and what Bob could be? So, they're playing catch all summer, but Josh doesn't stop there. Josh gets some kids together from the neighborhood, goes down to the Logan Fontenelle Projects where they live, uh, rounds up some kids, including Rodney Weed, and he builds a baseball team. He names them the, y the North YMCA Monarchs after their heroes in the Negro Leagues, the Kansas City Monarchs. And they go down to Burdett Field, and he's pounding the ball. He's pounding ground balls and hitting fly balls and uh, it, it's sort of turning these kids from the bad news bears into something real. And he would show up. He would show up uh, on an afternoon with, uh, with a stack of books under his arm, walking, walking there from Creighton University. And this Rodney Weed, who... Uh, who always looked, looked at Josh as sort of a father figure himself. Rodney would ask him, you know, what are you reading? And, and Josh would share with Rodney what he, was, what he was learning at Creighton. And here we are 60 years later. Rodney Weed is an 84-year-old black history professor uh, in St. Louis University, still teaching six months after, a, after suffering a stroke. He was an entrepreneur. He was a civil rights activist. Uh, he's still sharing his knowledge in St. Louis, Missouri. And that's because of Josh. Josh takes this team and he builds them up at Burdett Field, but he doesn't stop there. He starts putting ads in the, in the newspaper, starts putting ads in the World Herald. And uh, God bless him for that. We wish more people would do that these days. But uh, Josh takes, uh, he takes these advertisements and he says, games wanted. Uh, I have a little league baseball team in North Omaha. If you want to play us, give me a call. He gets most of his calls from rural Iowa, okay, Woodbine, Red Oak, Avoca, uh, and he takes his team of 11- and 12-year-old black kids from North Omaha, and he loads them into an old orchestra bus or an army truck with the, with the canvas on the back or a U-Haul or whatever he can find, and he takes these kids out into the country to these little, these little ball diamonds in, in rural Iowa. And if you can imagine, okay, imagine being on that bus uh, and, and sitting with those kids as they're leaving the projects in, in Omaha for the first time. There's a kid named Wendell Booth who is so fascinated by what he's seeing on the horizon that his friends nickname him Corn, okay, because he just looks around and he says, Woo, look at the corn. 
Okay, so you understand what it's like, what it might be like to be in that bus pulling up to the sandlot, but you might also think about what it's like to be those white kids in Avoca or Red Oak uh, watching this U-Haul truck pull up and uh, the door comes open and 12, you know, 12 uh, black kids from the projects get out to play in a baseball game. That would be a little bit of an eye-opener too. So uh, you might suspect or you might imagine that, that Josh was a little bit worried about injustice in these environments. And when he showed up in these small towns, he had an eye on the umpire. Okay? He was a little bit worried that he might get cheated, and often did. But he was not, he was not afraid. He, he was okay losing. He would not be cheated. So when, a, when an umpire would make a call, there was a guy in Griswold, uh, a home plate umpire. He, uh, he was a sher local sheriff, and he wore a baby mattress for a chest protector. And he had a terrible stutter, and when the ball would cross home plate, he'd say, B -b -b strike! And Josh would get so angry. Uh, he did this in lots of towns where he'd storm out of the dugout and go face to face with that umpire. And every time he stormed out, uh, those kids in the dugout from North Omaha would just put their heads down and say, oh no, he's going to get us all killed. He didn't get them killed. In fact, in August of 1950, Josh Gibson led the North Omaha YMCA Monarchs to uh, Wayne, Nebraska. Their bus broke down on the way there, but they got to Wayne, Nebraska, and they won three games in three days, and they won the state midget championship. So if you're ever in a trivia contest and somebody says, what was the first championship Bob Gibson ever won? You, you need to say the 1950 Midget League uh, in Wayne, Nebraska. So Josh comes back home, and he keeps doing his thing, and he's teaching more kids. Uh, baseball is kind of his, his passion. But uh, he's doing lots of different things. I mean, he's through the YMCA and the city rec department. He, uh, OPS wouldn't hire him to, uh, to teach physical education in the schools. So he basically turned North Omaha into the biggest PE class you've ever seen. And he was, he was running uh, volleyball and ping pong and uh, wheelchair basketball and all these things out of these YMCA and city rec programs, and it was very progressive. I mean, there was a girl, a 14-year-old girl from Tech High, Maggie King, she almost went to the Olympics. Um, she didn't have any real training, but, but she was learning how to compete in, in North Omaha. Josh is doing his thing, and he's gonna keep doing his thing for, for another 15 or 20 years. At the same time, Omaha is, uh, is, do, is, is also progressive in civil rights. There are two currents in this story, okay? And for most of this story, they're going to run parallel to each other like this. There's a sports current and uh, a civil rights current. And at the same time that sports has taken off and this young generation of athletes is, is blossoming, North Omaha is, is in the thick of the civil rights movement. And that really goes all the way back to the 20s, uh, and there's a strong history of it. Malcolm X's father was came to Omaha in the in the late 19 teens and early 20s and when in 1925 a local branch of the KKK shows up at his house and breaks windows and basically runs his family out of town in the 30s uh, a, a black newspaper publisher one of the only black women newspaper publishers in the entire country named Mildred Brown came comes comes on the scene Mildred Brown is uh, she's got that same Gibson tenacity. She is, uh, she, she's very elegant. She's very formal. She uh, always rides around in a Cadillac and is wearing these elegant dresses and hats and always a red carnation. Uh, and, and yet, at the same time, when a local business uh, won't advertise or support her Omaha star, she will threaten to, uh, to uh, you know, basically name them in print. And again, God love her, we could use her at the World Herald right now. Um, so Mildred Brown is, is, is uh, it comes on the scene in the 30s. And in the late 40s, she teams up with a Creighton priest, a white Creighton priest named Father John Marcou. Father John Marcou has his own interesting story. He is a, a former football star at West Point. He played with Dwight Eisenhower, and you know, was an All-American. He had these dashing looks. And Father John Marcoux, uh, his problem, he's, he graduates about 88th out of 108 in his class. And he ends up on the Mexican border in the Army a couple years later. Uh, he's got an alcohol problem, and he gets kicked out of the Army, and he, he, he ends up in a, in a Mexican jail cell. 
He escapes the Mexican jail cell, sort of has a conversion, uh, and, and sort of gives his life over to fighting injustice and specifically racial discrimination. John Marcoux has a quote. Uh, he says, racism is a goddamn thing. And that's two words, goddamned. And John Marcoux goes to St. Louis University and becomes a priest. And in the 40s, he tries to integrate uh, St. Louis University. St. Louis University is not ready for that in the 40s. They run him out. He comes to Omaha where he joins the faculty at Creighton and they sort of ostracize him too. But if you know the geography of this area, Father John Marcoux is at Creighton University and Mildred Brown is basically a half a mile north at the Omaha Star. And in the late 40s, they form one of the earliest civil rights organizations in the entire country. They are boycotting and picketing uh, and protesting things all over town from laundromats uh, to ice cream parlors to the Coca-Cola bottling company. This DePores Club is what they called it and it was uh, a combination of, of a lot of uh, leaders from the black community with Creighton students. They are uh, they're very active in, uh, in drawing attention to, to civil rights activism and their biggest target was the the streetcar and bus company in Omaha which wouldn't hire black drivers. So they, they fought this battle for several years trying to get black drivers hired uh, with the streetcar company and the bus company. And when Omaha wouldn't do it, uh, when the bus company wouldn't do it, Mildred Brown shared with her, with her consumers the idea that if you have to pay, if you have to take the bus, if you have to pay 18 cents, do it in 18 pennies. Because these drivers hate when you pay in pennies. Guess who was doing that four years later in Montgomery, Alabama? Martin Luther King. That's not a coincidence necessarily, okay? Martin Luther King's wife and Mildred Brown were old friends. And uh, how, how much, where that idea initially came from, that it's a mystery that's a little bit lost in time, but, but Omaha is, is just as ferocious and tenacious uh, in civil rights as they are in sports at this time. So we're going through the 50s now, and this generation of, of athletes, Josh Gibson's uh, sort of disciples, are growing up, and Bob Gibson is, uh, goes to Creighton University, where he's a leading scorer. He becomes a Harlem Globetrotter. Uh, Bob, Gibbs, or Bob Boozer goes to Tech High and then Kansas State University, where he's an All-American. He beats Wilt Chamberlain. He goes to the Olympics. He wins a gold medal in 1960. Roger Sayers, as we get into the 60s, uh, Roger Sayers becomes the fastest man in America in, in the summer of 1962. He beats Bullet Bob Hayes. Gail Sayers becomes uh, probably the most prestigious and sought after high school football recruit Nebraska's ever had. He disses the Huskers and goes to Kansas University, where he becomes an All-American and gets drafted by the Chicago Bears. Uh, Marlon Briscoe is coming on the scene. He's coming up through South Omaha and South High and Omaha University where he's an NAIA All-American. All these guys are kind of rising up. And as we get into the 60s, the civil rights movement across America is really taken off too. And they can, they can open their newspapers and read what's going on in the South in Alabama. Uh, the summer of 1963 where a, a segregationist governor from Alabama named George Wallace is fighting to keep blacks out of, uh, out of public schools in Alabama. Uh, where a civil rights leader in 63 named Medgar Evers is assassinated. And this sort of spills, spills over to Omaha. And there's a, a new sense of militance that takes over as we get into the 60s. And the inspiration for it, or at least the leader of it, is not Mildred Brown at that point. It's not Father John Marcoux. It is a young, brash, uh, tight t-shirt wearing, Barber, uh, Creighton University, Creighton Law School, and he would go on to serve about, well, what is it, 50 years in the state legislature at this point? Ernie Chambers comes on the scene in the early 60s. And Ernie takes a look at the landscape, and he, he hears everybody telling him and his, and his friends to be patient. It's going to change. It's going to change. Just stick with it. Stick with the fight. And Ernie and the people of his, uh, sort of his progressive force uh, believe that they've waited long enough and that they need new tactics. And he, Ernie's inspiration is the man who was born in, in Omaha in, in 1925, Malcolm X. 
Malcolm X comes back to Omaha in the summer of 1964, the one time he only ever came back to Omaha, to his hometown where he was born, and he delivered a speech, a fiery speech at the Civic Auditorium. And that night, uh, at a downtown hotel, he and Ernie Chambers uh, stayed up late into the night with friends, talking, sharing ideas, finishing each other's sentences, as one, as one person who was in the room put it. And nine months later, Malcolm X is assassinated. And for the rest of the decade, and arguably for the, rest, uh, for the last 50 or 60 years, Ernie Chambers has basically been, uh, been the voice of Malcolm X in North Omaha. So what is their, what is their primary source of contention? Is it, is it employment? Yes. Is it education? Yes. But even more than that, it's housing. It is the physical segregation and the ramifications of creating a ghetto in which blacks can't escape uh, on the near north side. And Ernie is fighting this battle in so many ways. He shows up at a city council meeting in 1964 wearing a pin that says, uh, uh, don't let your daughter marry a real estate man. Okay, Ernie always had a sense of humor about these things. But uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, just just what, uh, what the, the mood was back then when it came to open housing. This is from a former city councilman, a real estate icon, N.P. Dodge, and he's talking about housing and how it's different than everything else. This, again, this is a white real estate leader in Omaha in 1963. I don't believe the Negro fully comprehends the depth of this feeling, nor the distinction between this barrier and others, such as job opportunity and education. The white man will trade and work with the Negro. He will purchase from a Negro clerk, ride in the same bus, eat in the same restaurant, occupy the same hotel. The same average white family will not purchase a house next to a Negro's home. And if a Negro family buys next to him, he will move. No real estate agent can alone change this pattern. Wherever it has been tried, he risks bankruptcy because the 90% white majority on whom he depends for his livelihood will cease to trade with him. Any business which loses 90% of its customers fails. When the white neighborhood will accept a Negro as a neighbor, as it is now doing on an increasingly broader scale in restaurants, stores, hotels, and offices, this last barrier to first-class citizenship will disappear. Housing becomes the primary civil right, the primary mm -hmm. battleground uh, in Omaha in the, in the 60s. And it really comes to... Uh, comes to a culmination point um, in the state legislature in 1963, 1965, 1967. There are fierce debates about whether Nebraska needs an open housing law and whether homeowners and landlords should have the right to discriminate who they sell or rent to based on race. In 67, the, the legislature votes, votes, open house, votes against open housing. It's a, it's a tight, tight vote, 28 to 21. And that's where we start to see uh, a, a great example of these two currents intersecting, okay? There's a sports current, there's a civil rights current. And in the mid 60s, they start going like this all the time. And Bob Gibson, he comes home in October 1964 after just beating the New York Yankees in Game 7 of the World Series. He beats Mantle and Maris. Game 7 of the World Series, there's not a bigger thing in sports. There's not a bigger opponent in sports. Gibson beats him, this kid from the Logan Fontenelle Projects. He comes home in October 1964. He gets, uh, he gets the parade. They pick him up at the airport. They run him all the way through downtown. They give him a key to the city. It is the biggest deal that Omaha's had in years. Two years later, when Bob Gibson wants to move to Rockbrook, his new neighbors in West Omaha try to run him out of the neighborhood. In 1967, two days after the open housing vote in the legislature, Bob Boozer, who makes more than 99% of the people in Omaha, he tries to buy a lot, a housing lot, in Colonial Acres in Northwest Omaha. His housing developer, two days after the legislature vote, calls him and says, sorry, your neighbors won't allow it. There are these paradoxes that keep coming up. How, how do white people, how do they cheer for Gibson and Boozer and Sayers and Briscoe and all these guys while at the same time saying, no, you can't live next to me? These are the things that drive 
blacks in North Omaha crazy. These are the things that make Ernie Chambers the way he is. These are the things that, uh, that prompt sort of these explosions uh, of, of, of temper in, in that come up in first in, in July 4th of 1966. And about 100 kids are hanging out one night in the Safeway parking lot at 24th and Lake Street. And some police officers come by, they respond to a call, and these kids throw a, a firecracker at the police car, and pretty soon there's hundreds of National Guardsmen flooding into North Omaha uh, to, to keep the peace or restore order. And there's three, three nights of riots that, that break out in July of 1966, and another wave a month later in August of 66. And this 24th and Lake District, this commercial district that was that was so beloved, so vibrant, changes changes dramatically in the summer of '66. The next big explosion comes in March of 1968, when that segregationist governor, that spokesman of racism across America, George Wallace, comes to comes to North Omaha in the Civic Auditorium to uh, to jumpstart his his presidential campaign, his third third party presidential campaign. And a couple days before the state basketball tournament, uh, in the same venue where they're supposed to hold the state basketball tournament, the Civic Auditorium, Wallace walks on the stage, uh, and according to the Nebraska governor, he and his supporters essentially set a trap that night. They allowed about 40, 50 protesters to stand right in front of the stage, and there were some, some, uh, some verbal uh, insults back and forth, and a police officer and a protester got into it, and pretty soon a melee breaks out, and that spills out into the streets, and that spills up to North 24th Street, and we have three more nights of riots on North 24th Street. This is the week of the state basketball tournament. This may be the, most, the biggest intersection of all, because the state's best basketball player, the best high school basketball player in the state is a 6'7 center from Omaha Central named Dwayne Dillard. Dwayne Dillard is like a 1960s Kevin Garnett, okay? He's, he frequently gets 20, 25, 30 points and 20 rebounds and eight block shots, statistics that you don't see anymore. And Dwayne Dillard, two nights before the state tournament, in the midst of the Wallace riots, uh, is pulled over in a car. He's a passenger in a car, and he's pulled over, and police find Molotov cocktails in the back of the car. And all of a sudden, um, sports and civil rights and everything that's in the mix just explodes. And there's a moment here, uh, there's a great, a great column in a, in a, a Wally Provost column um, that I wanted to read to you. This is from uh, March of 1968. Dillard was not just another boy in trouble, he was a symbol. To some people he was an accused criminal who should be dealt with firmly and promptly. He symbolized all that they feared from lawlessness. To another faction, he was a school athletic hero, perhaps even an idolized rebel. Considering the extreme emotions of the city, this was a hot one. Anyone who touched it could expect to get burned. They moved the state tournament to Lincoln, where it's been ever since. And uh, Dillard was suspended the first game. But the night before he was suspended, his coach, this is Wednesday night before a Thursday morning state tournament opener. His coach looks out the window, and this, is, this thing is all over the news. Is, is Dillard going to play? Is Dillard going to play? And his coach looks out the window about 8, 9 o'clock at night, 12 hours before their state tournament opener, and there's two crosses burning in his front yard in, in Omaha. There was a serious, serious resistance to what Dillard did and what he represented. And he was suspended the first game. Came back, played in the second game, and in the championship game, Omaha Central, number one in the state, faced Lincoln Northeast, and Northeast beat them. And that was a crushing, crushing defeat for Omaha Central and North Omaha. That was March of 68. We're getting into, uh, again, one of the most interesting years in American history here. And a month later, Martin Luther King would be assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And two months after that, Bobby Kennedy would be assassinated in Los Angeles. And this is the summer of, of Bob Gibson's greatest achievement. He has arguably the greatest pitching season of all time in the summer of 68. And that fall, 
uh, Gail Sayers is doing his thing, and Bob Boozer is having his best NBA season, and Tommy Smith and John Carlos are standing on the medal stand in Mexico City doing this, and everything is just kind of boiling. Um, and in the, in the midst of that, something is happening outside of the sports headlines, and North Omaha is crumbling. It is falling apart. The mentors, uh, Josh Gibson most prominently, is sort of stepping into the background. The, uh, the, the packing houses that were so critical, what's that? Uh, the packing houses that were so critical to, to the economic stability and vitality of this neighborhood in a matter of about three years in North Omaha and, and in South Omaha, the packing house culture basically collapses. The meat packing industry where, where thousands of farmers and ranchers would bring their livestock to South Omaha and line up on L Street uh, to, to trade and to sell, uh, suddenly new competitors are, are popping up in, in northern, northern Nebraska, northwest Iowa, small towns like Iowa beef packers. What you're seeing right now, 50, 60 years later, uh, the trends in the meatpacking industry, that started in the late 60s with the collapse of, of the, the South Omaha stockyards. And those, those workers, those guys who, who came, uh, who came, drove five miles down to South Omaha every day to, to do the work, most of those guys lost their jobs and couldn't replace those jobs in any other industries because other industries weren't as integrated and they weren't as well paying. Kathy Hughes, a, a, a black media icon in Washington, D.C., she compared the, the collapse of the packing house industry in South Omaha to a bomb going off in her, in her North, North Omaha community. It was a huge, huge deal. And at the same time, uh, this tight, cohesive, bonded community, one square mile in size, uh, the city of Omaha basically draws a line, or maybe a knife, and cuts it right down the middle with the North Freeway. In the late 60s, uh, ironically, an idea that was created to help farmers and ranchers get to South Omaha faster they build a North Freeway right through the middle of the near north side. And they do it in part because of, of the, the stockyards. They do it in part because businessmen in Florence and uh, parts north of the city don't want to drive through 24th Street to get to their downtown offices. So they build this freeway right through the middle of the neighborhood. And 50 years later, you talk to people who live there, they still swear, the north, they still swear at the North Freeway because of its impact on, on the cohesion of the community. So all these things are happening in the late 60s. And uh, the, real, the real death knell for, the, for North Omaha comes in June of 1969. This is the third and the most damaging riot of all, where a 14-year-old girl is in, a, is in the Logan Fontenelle Projects, this unbelievable community uh, where Bob Gibson and Rodney Weed and Preston Love and Kathy Hughes and all these people grew up. And by the late 60s, the projects have taken on a very different role and meaning in the community. And there's a police call, uh, a break-in, in June of 1969. And the police show up, and a 14-year-old girl runs out of a door and runs down an alley. And a police officer named James Loader steps out behind her and looks at Vivian Strong and shoots her in the back of the head. And the most, um, at that point, African Americans in North Omaha, they didn't really care what they burned. And they looked for every white business they could on North 24th Street. Um, it was a small group, but it was a ferocious group. And the anger that, that had built up over so many years just kind of came out for the last time for those next couple days. And there's a Brenda Council, who was a, who was a state legislator, and a, she ran for mayor a couple times, and she remembers, she remembers that night, specifically the night of the Vivian Strong shooting. She was supposed to pick up her mom at the hospital. She was driving a car. She was 16, 17 years old, an Omaha Central student. And she was in charge of picking up her mom at the hospital where she was a nurse. Uh, and at that point, this is 1030 at night, something like that, the riots are just starting. And Brenda Council, uh, drives out of the community, basically gets to, gets to the gate, uh, the unofficial gate of North Omaha, 30th Street, and the police, um, they, they will, 
they will they stop her they stop her at 30th street and they want to make sure who she is and where she's going because they don't want to let her out but if you want to go back in when she when she's driving her mom home that's fine they essentially quarantine the neighborhood and the the message was clear what happens here we're just going to let it happen um, we're we're going to wash our hands of it and for the next few days next few weeks next few months that was kind of how north omaha was treated it was you're on your own um, people can go in but you're not bringing the conflict out and north omaha was uh basically ceased ceased to exist the way that people knew it in the 50s and early 60s after the vivian strong riots so this is happening at the same time that Gibson is, uh, Gibson is rising to the peak of his powers and Sayers is rising to the peak of his powers and Boozer and Briscoe and Johnny Rogers is going to come down to Nebraska and win a Heisman Trophy and we have this incredible paradox where the, this incredible, uh, the best generation of athletes that Nebraska has ever produced, uh, as they reach the peak, the infrastructure and the system and the network that created them will essentially be cut off. It's like somebody back home shutting off a spigot. And North Omaha would never really be the same. So 24th and Glory is a, is a project and a story of incredible triumph. It is, it is a, a project uh, that details the, the greatest athletes that, that our state has ever produced. At the same time, it is a story of incredible tragedy because it is a neighborhood that was essentially lost in a, in a rather short amount of time. And uh, it, it only took me about 13 years to get it done. So uh, it is 10 for, it's 12.45, and that's about what time I was supposed to finish up. I want to go through a few slides with you just to help you put images with, with, uh, with words here. This is my favorite image of the entire book. This is Bob Gibson in all of his grace and glory. Uh, look at just... <laughs> This is, this is the, the day that he struck out 17 Detroit Tigers in game one of the World Series in 1968. And uh, it's hard to see how Bob Gibson doesn't fall down when he's, when he's throwing like that. This is Marlon Briscoe, who emerged in the fall of 68 as the best rookie quarterback in the NFL. Bob Boozer. Gail Sayers. Ron Boone. Ron Boone would be a basketball star, too, uh, in the early 70s. Roger Sayers, 1962, fastest man in the world. Johnny Rogers, Tech High senior in the fall of 68. This is a quiet look at uh, 24th and Lake Street in the early 50s. Look at all those streetcar wires. That's Josh Gibson. That's Bob's older brother. He very rarely looked at that, uh, what's the word? Peaceful. <laughs> South Omaha Stockyards. That building is still there, of course, but no nothing else around it is still there. That was a huge point of pride for Omaha in 1955, that when they became the, the world's largest stock market, or uh, meat packing center. This is one of the few photographs of, uh, of life inside the packing houses. Look how young Bob Gibson looks there. Senior at Tech High. Even younger, Bob Boozer. That's Gail Sayers breaking the uh, long jump record in 1961 at the state track meet. There's a great story about that where he gets down to his last jump and he's going against Bobby Williams from Lincoln High. And Gail, uh, he, needs, he needs to do better than what he's done. And his coach gives him a tip. And then his coach lays down a handkerchief, basically a target for Gail to jump at next to the pit as he's running down. And when Gail turns and runs back to the starting block uh, or up the runway, uh, the coach kicks it forward about another foot. And Gail broke the long jump record that stood for 43 years that day. This is one of the marches, uh, one of the civil rights marches uh, from North Omaha down to City Hall in 63, protesting open housing. Look at that. That's an aerial shot from the courthouse. 
this is a this is a huge story in the summer of '63. Um, I grew up going to Peeney Park when I was really little, and Peeney Park was kind of this wonderful place, uh, wonderful family amusement park. And blacks have a very very different memory of Peeney Park because throughout the '50s and early '60s, it was segregated, specifically the the swimming pool at Peeney Park. And this was the first day in July of 1963 that blacks could swim with whites at the Peeney Park swimming pool. This is a look at, open, at housing conditions on the north side in the mid-60s. It's the riots. This is March 1968, George Wallace's visit to North Omaha. He landed at Epley Airport and hundreds of people met him with cheers and jeers. This is actually a really uh, good illustration of what the, the, what the scene looked like at the Civic Auditorium that night. And you can see Wallace's supporters uh, on the side and in the back, and they allowed a very small group of protesters right in front of the stage. And that was, it's pretty easy to see how a conflict started. See that face right there? That's Rodney Weed. Rodney Weed shows up all over this story. It's unbelievable. He's protesting George Wallace at the Civic that night. Ernie Chambers. This is a girl, uh, this is a, a really, really touching scene of a girl reading, uh, reading words from Martin Luther King just a couple days after he was assassinated at a, at a North Omaha school, I believe. And this is the funeral of Vivian Strong in June of 1969. These guys, one of the reasons that it was so important to tell this story now, um, and granted, I should have told it 10 years ago, but one of the reasons it was so important is because, you know, these guys are getting up there in age. And Boozer passed away in 2012. Uh, Gail Sayers is suffering from very severe, severe dementia. Uh, Bob Gibson was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer this summer, and he's, he's fighting that right now. So it was really important to get these stories down while we could. And uh, <laughs> Gibson was actually my, probably my biggest excuse for not doing the story because he would not talk to me for 10 years. I tried in 2009. I got him on the phone. I said, Bob, you know, we're really excited about this. If it goes well, we might even turn it into a book. I was trying to demonstrate how serious I was about this. And he said, well, if you're going to turn it into a book, I don't want to talk to you. I said, no, what? No, I was just saying that. Uh, 2012, after Boozer passed away, I tried to get him. He said no again. Uh, tried to get him at a statue unveiling at Warner Park. I said, Bob, well, can we sit down and talk about you know, where you grew up? Nope. Uh, I got him on an airplane one time coming home from Penn State. He couldn't possibly say no to me on an airplane. He said no to me on an airplane. <laughs> But uh, after about two chapters ran in the newspaper this summer, I was, I was with my kids on a Saturday afternoon, and the phone rang, and uh, it was Bob Gibson. And he and I talked for 40, 45 minutes, and he said, uh, you know, the first couple chapters were good, and he's actually done a lot to help us since then sort of distribute it to his friends. So Joe Torrey, Tim McCarver, Bob Costas, all these guys, Bob Gibson, of all people, has helped us get the word out about this project. The other big obstacle in, uh, or maybe the, maybe the guy that I was afraid of next to Gibson was obviously Ernie. And first of all, Ernie and Bob Gibson were, were, were classmates in a Spanish class at Creighton University in 1955. Now, I want you to think about the, the, the Spanish teacher and ha what, what that must have been like trying to teach these two guys. But anyway, uh, but, but Chambers, um, I, I didn't think he would talk to me, and I got him on the phone once, and he, we talked for about, I don't know, 90 minutes, and he was kind of all over the place, and, and he sa at the end of it, he said, you can't use any of that. I was like, okay, and I just didn't think Ernie was ever going to support it, and, and after about five chapters ran in the, in the newspaper, my phone rang, and again, uh, I'm driving in the car, and and it's Ernie, and he's, he's really enthusiastic about what he's read in the newspaper. And he said, have you ever taken a genealogy test? And I said, I said no. He goes, well, don't do it. I said, why not? He goes, because you, you might find that you and I are brothers from another mother. 
So we got Ernie, we got Bob Gibson. Uh, after that, it's all been pretty easy. So uh, I want to. I, I got about five minutes left, and I, I want to take a few questions if you guys are interested in something. Yes, sir. Kirk, you were at the Big Red Breakfast a few weeks ago, and you had some panelists. I'm sorry, I don't remember who all was there. I know that Johnny. There were stories that came out of there. So first, I'm sorry, but could there be another book? I know there could be, and would you write it? But then second, the story that sticks with me, and I think about it so often, was when they talked about Bob Devaney, the Irish guy that stood up for African Americans, not only in the recruiting thing, but what he did at the university with creating scholarships. Yeah. Can you just... Hit on a couple of those and then just so the question is about Bob Devaney and his role in, in sort of changing. Uh, the University of Nebraska had a huge problem in the early 60s in terms of their perception and reputation in the black community, specifically in North Omaha. And Gail Sayers uh, snubbing Nebraska to go to Kansas was, was kind of the, the eye-opening moment there. And when Devaney took the job, I mean, he was very aware of it. He also understood that he wasn't going to be successful unless he could recruit black athletes from North Omaha. So he became very, very aggressive in doing that in a way that most coaches around the country were not. And um, he would, for instance, he would go into, go into homes of, of black recruits. That was very unusual back then. Most, most white football and basketball coaches would come to the high school. You know, they'd hang out in the coach's office or the principal's office. They'd meet with the kid. Bob Devaney went, he went right into their homes. And uh, he went right into Johnny Rogers' house. And in fact, Johnny Rogers still remembers coming down the steps and looking at Bob Devaney for the first time and thinking he looked like Mr. Potato Head. Okay, but Devaney was, he was very persistent. He would come to, he would go to Tech High almost every day to recruit Johnny Rogers in the winter of 1969. And, and the reference to, to creating scholarships, one of the big problems that Nebraska had was they didn't have any female black students in the late 60s. So Devaney took an active role in creating scholarships for black girls to get them enrolled at the university, essentially to give uh, you know, black athletes like Gail Sayers and Johnny Rogers an excuse to come to, to UNL. Yes, sir. Josh Gibson, what, what was the money behind his efforts? to start these various programs? Was he, was he like employed as a city uh, person? So the question is about Josh Gibson and his role, uh, or, or his, his, essentially his day job. It's not cheap to start a baseball team. Well, he did it pretty cheap. I mean, he would take donations for uniforms and equipment and things like that. But, but he was supported through the city rec department uh, for a while and also the, the YMCA for a while. So he had a day job and his, you know, he was essentially just going out in the community and starting youth programs. He had support through the city and the YMCA to do that, um, which was, again, it was, it was very, very fortunate, in a, in a, fortuitous in a way, because if he's working in the schools all day, he doesn't have the liberty and probably the imagination to do what he did. So there, there are certain moments in this thing where, you know, segregation was obviously a moral wrong and, and a horrible thing, but you can't, you can't dispute that one of the reasons that things developed the way they did, uh, that some of these kids were so motivated and driven was because of the segregated environment they came from. And, and it, you know, one of the manifestations of that was Josh Gibson working through the YMCA rather than Omaha Public Schools. Okay. Yes, ma'am, one more. Do you, from your research and interviews and you're telling this story, do you have a sense of the future of North Omaha? Do I have a sense of the future of North Omaha? I think there is a there is there is a real uh, a real mission right now in the community to rebuild what was there. Uh, there's some momentum, and I think it's partly because there's a little bit more recognition for the history that was there. Also, there's just a younger crop of of individuals. In some cases, they're the children and grandchildren of, of kind of the icons who were there, who were moving into the neighborhood and deciding we want to revitalize this to what it was. It's very difficult to do that because, um, you know, for one thing, when the neighborhood opened up, there, there's just not, there's not the, the connection to geographically to North Omaha that there was. And until you can really rebuild housing and businesses in that area, it's going to be difficult to do. 
thank you guys all for coming. Uh, it was very nice of you, and thanks for good questions, too.